Okay, welcome back. Uh, and just say this is this is what everyone waits for. This is the big moment. Uh, so your introduction to Metabo Analyst. Um, usual slides here. Um, so to introduce you to Metabo Analyst, I think what I'll do is, is just cover a couple of general issues with respect to uh, analyzing or working with metabolomic data. Um, some of this quite should be reasonably familiar with you. Some of it's a bit of a review, but it's just sort of a, a gentle introduction to what we will be doing with, with Metabo Analyst. Uh, so there's a standard workflow. There's issues of data checking, detection of outliers, quality control, scaling, uh, normalization. And we'll dive into Metabo Analyst. So this is a slide we saw before, and this is just again to remind you that what we do in metabolomics is we often have uh, group studies where we will have 30, 40, 50, and we call of, of, of an animal, a plant, humans, whatever. And those are what we will call biological replicates. Um, so the, the normals are supposed to be biological replicates. The, the abnormals are supposed to be biological replicates. But the intent is to have some measure of um, biological diversity, um, and it should be some normal distribution, which is why the replicates usually are 30, 40, 50, or 60 uh, animals, plants, or humans. And then we will do this technical replicate thing. Uh, not enough, though, and this is one of the major issues with metabolomics, is that many people don't do technical replicates. Um, and many people don't do enough quality control uh, to assess both the performance of their instrument and their sample preparation. Um, so we're all pretty good about getting biological replicates. We're all pretty bad at doing the technical replicates. And so this is a reminder that you should consider that in your experimental design. So is a duplicate or a triplicate okay for a metabolomics run? Uh, you can have duplicates. In many cases, what people do is they don't do two of everything, but they'll have um, quality control samples, one every five, one every ten. Uh, sometimes they'll uh, rerun a subsample uh, and just to make sure things are consistent. Sometimes they'll pool samples uh, and create a single uh, reference sample that they'll, they'll throw in to make sure that things are performing properly and, and, and uh, reproducibly. So it's not like microarrays or for many years people would do three and four of the same thing. Um, but uh, in the case of mass spectrometry, uh, yes, it's not a good, not a bad idea to to do duplicates. Um, two routes to metabolomics. Again, this is another slide we've talked about. Um, but there are essentially two different workflows depending on what route you've chosen. So one, what we've been trying to emphasize is this idea of quantitative targeted metabolomics. The other one that is still widespread. Some of you may still do this, um, is that larger scale chemometric one. So the workflow in the chemometric one is first to collect your data, check it. That's the in data integrity check. You know, if you've got a blank sample or blank run or null data, okay, that's not good. If you've got scaling problems or things that have been lost at the tail end of, of the run, that's not good. So you're checking that. Usual route is to then perform some kind of spectral alignment. You guys learned about that in XCMS. Uh, some aspect of binning, although more and more people are just simply doing peak um, uh, identification. Computers are so much faster that you don't need to do binning anymore. Then there's a data normalization. This is to make it look Gaussian, but there's also a scaling thing that may also be done. There may also be uh, some quality control efforts. Those may be at the very beginning, they may be at later stages, and then outlier detection and removal. Uh, and then you do their data reduction analysis, which is the PCA or PLSDA. It's after that that you've presumably identified which features, which bins, which peaks, are <laughs> most symptomatic of the changes. So this is where you'll be looking at your um, scores plot and trying to figure out which of those peaks are, are, are important. Then you'll go back and, and look at the peaks and stare at them and stare at them and stare at them and hopefully you'll be able to figure out what they are. Um, the 
targeted approach is a little different, although the same sort of components, but just in a different order. Data integrity check is done to make sure you've got the right data and that it's correct. Then you go immediately to the compound identification and quantification. So that's what you guys did with the Konomics thing and what we tried to do in some aspects of uh, the GCMS examples and things like that. Once you have your list of compounds and their concentrations, then you do this normalization. You'll see how it's done in, in metabolomalis, but this is to try and generate Gaussian distributions. You also do some scaling to deal with dilution effects. You will, after that, also check to see whether there are any outliers, whether there's some strange looking data sets. Um, and at that point, you can do your data reduction analysis and produce your PLSDA and PCA plots or your rock curves or anything else you want to do. So these are, as you say, as you can see, there's different uh, order, but largely similar components. And so these components are part of metabolomics, but they should be part of every um, metabolomic analysis. So I'm going to talk about these a little bit, some of which you've already discussed already. So the data integrity issue, it's a particular problem with LCMS. It is also a problem with GCMS. There's lots of fake peaks in all of the data. So we learned about adducts, we learned about neutral loss issues. In GCMS there's the extra derivatization products and uh, that's why you have to run blank blanks. There are isotope peaks and you have to do de-isotoping. Um, there are inadvertent breakdown products and you have to deal with those. Um, and so those are usually dealt with with some cases software that we've mentioned, some of them dealt with with the instruments that you're using. Um, this issue of false positives is not a problem with NMR. And that's one of the reasons why we chose to do it as, a, as an example. It just was a little cleaner for you guys. But since most people don't do NMR, um, it was just done as, as largely an example. The way you can help sort these things out is using those technical replicates. So what I've just illustrated here is some you know, real-life data where there is a contaminant that pops up. Uh, so you've got two samples where the same peak is there and then another sample where some other thing just sort of blows up. Um, and the question is, is it a real peak? Is it not? That's sometimes difficult to sort out. Um, some cases it's a matter of checking to see if you've um, done something differently in, in the course of it. So this is why usually running duplicates or replicates helps you sort these spurious peaks out. We've run and worked on XCMS. You guys have learned about uh, aspects of uh, of alignment. Um, this is particularly useful for um, MS, LCMS. It's also particularly useful for GCMS. And this is because there's this always drifting uh, in terms of how LC uh, or even GC um, uh, columns perform. And um, this is just an example of what, what's done. And these are some tools that you guys have gotten familiar with or heard about. Binning is another thing we talk about. It's, it's slowly going away. Uh, can, you can bin NMR spectra, you can bin GCMS spectra, you can bin uh, LCMS spectra. This is done typically as a, for people doing chemometric analysis. Um, these days because computers are much bigger, disk drives are much bigger, uh, bins are getting smaller and smaller to the point that bins are just simply peaks. And so <coughs> it's just peak picking. Um, so, what is, exactly? what is binning? binning? Yeah. So, it's a way of dividing, in this case, we'll say an NMR spectrum into okay. um, 14 chunks of, of uh, like a half ppm or one ppm bins. And then a bin will have several peaks in this case and usually an integrated area. And so, you just have the area under the curve and position of the bin. As I said, that was when computers were small and weak. Um, now we have much more powerful systems and so the binning has, has largely just become peaks. And I just mark down all the peaks and the areas under each peak. Normalization and scaling. Uh, you can see on the right side where basically it's an identical spectrum but one is about three times bigger than the other. Uh, you want to um, uh, deal with those things so that you're sort of comparing apples to apples. So if this is a dilution issue, 
which is common with urine, but it can also be a problem with sample preparation. It can be a problem with, uh, with solid samples, with having too much water, and so things didn't uh, produce as much as you want. So you can scale, and there are scaling methods we'll talk about. Uh, the scaling allows you to look to, in some cases, internal standards. So in, in urine, we use an internal standard called creatinine. Uh, but we can also look at uh, the total uh, specific volume or specific gravity or total organic content. Um, there's a technique called probabilistic quotient methods. Um, the, the integrated area is another way to help uh, normalize or scale. Each of these requires a little bit of knowledge about your system or sample. And um, particularly with, with, with cell samples, uh, in some cases fecal or microbial samples, you have to consider these quite uh, seriously because it, it makes the samples um, uh, comparisons difficult if you can't normalize properly. Yeah. Is it common practice to normalize to a particular example, like that in case of urine, it's more or less at a yeah, for, for urine, the standard, the clinical standard is to normalize to creatinine. Um, there are better methods, I think. People are finding that normalizing to the total organics uh, is better. If, if you can measure it by NMR or you can measure it by other assays and you can measure all the components there. Um, that's a more robust method. Um, in the case of, say, uh, fecal water, uh, this is a problem. There isn't something like creatinine. And uh, uh, in that case, you're trying to do uh, a wet mass of cells uh, or material. And uh, you have to sort of post hoc measure that. Um, but if you can normalize then to the total mass of the extracted tissue or whatever material you're working with, then that, that makes it reasonably consistent. Um, so uh, again, this is just more about the scaling. Uh, some of the other things which are norm normalization uh, is that log transformation. So terms like log transformation, auto scaling, Pareto scaling, probabilistic quotient scaling, range scaling, these are all actually available through MetaboAnalyst, and they're explained in a little more detail. Uh, they're ones that you typically do by trial and error. Some work, some don't, depending on the data that you have. And having something that's interactive and visual, like MetaboAnalyst, helps a lot. Um, data filtering, this is again something you guys did when you were doing with economics. You removed, say, this, the water peak. That's one filtering. Uh, noise filtering is done with GCMS. Uh, it's part of AMDIS. Um, the removal of outliers, the removal of false positives, that's done with some of the local software that you, you get um, uh, with LCMS or GCMS instruments or some of the freeware that we've looked at. Um, the data reduction, we spent a good chunk of time last lecture going through PCA and PLSDA and the clustering, which is all part of the, the process of, of figuring out what you've just seen and why it's there. So that's just a quick overview uh, of, of some of the workflow, some of the issues, and, and all of these workflow components are part of MetaboAnalyst. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, when it was developed in 2009, it was quite new, uh, novel, and the idea of actually doing metabolomics work um, online was, was pretty unique. Um, it was designed to handle all the types of data that you would typically have, LCMS, GCMS, NMR, uh, to do all the univariate and multivariate testing, uh, to help generate useful plots, um, and then to link that to the biology pathways and um, uh, metabolite set enrichment issues, uh, other clustering approaches, all of those were, were built in and it's progressively been added to. And this is your, the work almost entirely of your TA, Jeff, 
uh, and uh, it's now in its second version, and he's working on version three, uh, which will be hopefully ready for next year. Faster, better, even more capable than before. But uh, we're going to work on version two right now. Uh, it's proven to be very popular, uh, and that's one reason why we might find a little bit of uh, maybe a little slower than ideally we want. So that on average, we have what 300 users at any given moment using Metabo Analyst. Um, it's broken down into sort of four general steps. Uh, there's a data pre-processing step, that's sort of your cleanup. The data normalization slash scaling, second step. The data analysis, which is sort of the fun part. Uh, and the data annotation, which is also critical, um, involved some aspects of, of metabolite identification, but also uh, creating uh, useful plots or, or generating um, reports that are useful. This is a flow diagram that's a little more detailed. Um, hopefully you guys can read uh, some of the text. It's, it's very small, but uh, the data input, it can take the raw spectra, it can take peak lists, or if you want, binned lists, spectral bins, or in the case of targeted quantitative metabolomics, you can get your concentration tables. Uh, those are the ones that we'll probably work with, or ideally would work with, is that concentration table first. Um, however, if you've got raw data, you can do spectral processing, you can do peak processing, you can do noise filtering. Uh, you can also put in uh, or what's called missing value estimation. Uh, some things, if they're below the limited detection, uh, you don't want to put a zero, but you want to have some sort of smallish value, which helps generate a, a more Gaussian uh, distribution. You can then uh, normalize or scale by rows or by columns, and it depends on whether you called your rows your sample or your columns your sample. Your rows your metabolites or your columns your metabolites, but each one is possible. After that, then you have a whole bunch of choices. You can do metabolite set enrichment analysis, you can do metabolite pathway analysis, you can do time series analysis, or you can do the classical multivariate analysis. So those are your four options. And then all of those things will give you graphs and pictures and tables and reports. Um, additionally, you can do some quality checking, uh, data QC assessments. Uh, you also supports peak uh, matching, peak searching, compound conversion, pathway mapping as well. So lots of options. So it's a fairly complicated piece of software. Um, so we're going to look at four components. We're going to do raw data processing with Metabolist. We're going to do data reduction with Metabolist. We're going to later move on to functional enrichment analysis using what's called metabolite set enrichment analysis, MSEA, and then pathway analysis with MetPA. Both MSEA and MetPA are now part of Metabolist. There are separate websites for them still, I guess. Um, um, they were originally produced as separate tools, but now they've been brought into Metabolanalyst and that has strengthened them quite a bit. So if you go to Metabolanalyst, um, uh, www.metaboanalyst.ca, you will see a page that looks a lot like this. And you can uh, click here to start. There's a little thing up in the corner, um, and that can open it up. Um, you can also then look at the data. Uh, there are data sets uh, and information on data formats to choose. Uh, so some of them you can download directly. Some of them you can upload. Uh, we have both options. So in this case, if you clicked on data formats, you could see uh, four or five different data sets that you can download to your hard drive. Uh, and these can be representing uh, both uh, uh, binned data, uh, compound concentration data, peak intensity tables, time series. So these are all real data sets. Um, some of them are also um, peak lists, and these are much larger, so they're zipped files. So all of these can be used and are intended for you to help demonstrate the feasibility with that. Uh, alternately, if you don't want to download the, the data, you can just go to some of the examples and you can just upload the data directly because uh, it sits on the Metaboanalyst hard drive. Um, so we'll jump into this, that part one, which is the data processing. 
So you're going to try and convert your raw data into data tables for doing statistical analysis. Rows and columns uh, with samples and, and, and metabolite values. And so uh, for the target analysis, which is what we're trying to emphasize um, in this course and what is becoming increasingly the norm for metabolomics in general, we'll, we'll look just at the concentration tables. You're free to work at some of the, or look at and use some of the other ones. And these are typical of untargeted <coughs> methods spectral bins, peak lists, raw spectra. Uh, so that's some of your XCMS data. Uh, as I said, you could have downloaded the files or you could also go upload and that saves you one or two clicks. Um, so we have uh, a couple of data types that, that you can choose from. Um, so in this case if you have downloaded it, you can upload it from your disk or you can go straight to try our test data, which is if you scroll down uh, you just click on the button and it will instantly load the data. So for this example, and you guys are going to be working on your own, we're actually going to be using this thing called the metabolite concentration data uh, of 30 some rumen samples measured by uh, NMR from dairy cows fed different proportions of cereal grains, 0%, 15%, 30%, and 45%. So I don't think any of you are doing agricultural research, fine, uh, and most of you do mass spec, fine. The important thing here is this is just, it's, it's real data, um, and uh, because it's from cows, it's publicly available, so we're not dealing with any clinical uh, issues. Um, and it's about tables. So you could have done this with mass spec, you could have done it with this GCMS, you could have done it with the HPLC, it's, it's just a targeted analysis. So don't, don't worry that it, it was actually done with NMR. So this is the data that you will try. Yes, Carolina. Uh, so what do you say about choosing the upload? Concentration is quite obvious, but what would be the difference between spectral beans and peak intensity? Say that again. What's the difference between the... Between uh, spectral beans and peak intensity? Okay, so the peak intensity table is really just having the bins shrunk down to really narrow so that they're just binning peaks. Bins are usually things that are somewhat wider and may include three or four peaks or even part of a peak. And as I said, back in 2009, binning was common. Now it's 2014. Binning is just about extinct. Um, but it's still there. It's still an example. Um, so normally, because when, when you do the data frame, you have to choose the peak intensity and then specific Yes, you could do that. It's it's if you want, you can call it data framing, but you're just cutting it up into yeah. different frames. And it was an it was an older technique. There's a lot of software that's been developed for that um, in the past, um, but it was done because computers five six years ago were were not able to handle some of the the amount of data processing. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, because in front of it, we don't have people, but I'm just talking about terms and different cultures. Yeah, if you pay me a mass factor and you're doing something, because some some columns go totally zero, nothing there. We always just want to pick the first class for the mass factor. Uh, mass factor. But I don't know how to do that. <clears throat> yeah. 
But I think Rose is right in that more and more people are just using peak intensity. So to some extent, the cultures are converging. Um, so everyone's just using peak tables, peak intensity tables, both in NMR and in mass spec. So if you uploaded the data, and hopefully you guys will go through this shortly, um, you will uh, see the data, it'll be processed, it'll look at it, it'll identify things that passed, identify how things have been grouped, any problems with it, and if you're happy with uh, the report, uh, you can just uh, skip. If you're not happy, uh, you can actually do some what's called missing value imputation, which is to create uh, usually numbers, uh, so they're fake, um, um, but which are reasonable based on the data that you've been already collecting. Um, so it's if you've got missing data and it's sort of like you've got this nice uh, line but you're missing three points and then the rest of the data continue, you can usually imagine that you could put those three points in there and say that's, that seems reasonable. Um, the reason why you do data imputation is to help keep a normal distribution because what's going to happen is that your missing data is either going to be, well, it's not a number, so computers don't like dealing with not a number. And the other thing is you want to make sure that the numbers aren't all zero, which then creates a bimodal distribution, where you have a whole bunch of zeros and then the rest of your data. And so bimodal data, data is, not, is not good. Statistical packages don't like that. So that's part of this option for, for dealing with uh, missing, missing data. Are there any best practices for um, replacing zero values? I think Jeff had mentioned one fifth of the minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, one half, one fifth. Uh, it's, it sort of varies, but it should be somewhat lower than the lower limit of detection, but not zero. <laughs> um, and some of it is some, you may know about your instrument. So in NMR, we know uh, typically that. If, uh, you know, a lower limit somewhere between a half to a third is fine. Mass spec, it may differ, um, and it depends on the instrument too. Uh, but it should be a real number, and it should not be zero. Can you select a minimum value? In, in metabolic analysis, yes, you can choose a, a minimum value. Like a zero, zero point five. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's something you can put in into the the data. In Otherwise, three. it has like a, a default choice. For it. it will, yes. So uh, if everything's gone through, and in this, in this example, everything should go through, so you don't have to do a whole lot of extra work, um, you're now going to do the scaling and or normalization. So um, in this case, the, the samples, the, the different cows in the rumen, are in your rows. And then the compounds are listed in columns. So there's, I don't know, 50, 60 different compounds and, I don't know, maybe about 39 uh, samples, rows. So it's about a 30, 39 by 60 roughly matrix. You're going to try and then look at the rows, and so you're going to, uh, you could do no normalization or no scaling. You could do normalization and scaling by looking for the median, the, ma, the, the sum. You could have some reference sample, which might be some uh, standard that's been added to it or, or some com completely distinct sample. Uh, in this one we're just pooling the average so we create a synthetic sample uh, that allows us to reference it. Uh, we could have normalized to a reference feature, so creatinine if this was urine. Uh, a specific normalization to a dry weight if we were dealing with some cells. Then we can normalize uh, now, so that was more a scaling issue, then for the columns, these are the metabolites. Um, these often, well, in more so with mass spec, but you can also have it with NMR, uh, you will have skewed distributions. Some that are clustering around one set and then another bunch that are way out there. And so you can do log scaling or in this case it's auto-scaling, uh, is one that's selected, but there's Pareto. But all of these are transformations that would hopefully generate a more normal-looking curve. What yes. hmm? What's that? Yeah, only log base 2. 
yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. Log base two is, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, frankly, the best way is to look. I still think it's the best way, but I, I think there are some. There are some, I think, mathematical tests that are sort of there. Uh, and people have asked about them. There's a QQ plot, and um, but yeah, I, I think especially Jeff, who's had to deal with this for five years, day and night. Um, his view uh, is that the visual inspection is your best and, and surest way. So you just build them and create, create a distribution? That's right. Well, this will do it for you. So this is this, uh, that's why people like the program, because it actually allows you to do all this very quickly. Um, so just again, the, the data is uploaded. We have the, the samples in rows, that's the cows, cow 1, cow 2 to cow 39, compounds, alanine, acetate, citrate, whatever. And then we've do, done these row-wise, column-wise normalization. You could do both together. Um, and the row-wise, in this case the samples, to make the, each other comparable. So we're just wanting to make sure that the sample, we're not dealing with dilution effects. So you could have had uh, you know, 38 cows that are nice, but then someone spilled one sample and added a lot of water, and so now it's eight times more dilute. This one will deal with that, that, that issue fairly well. Column-wise is the one that's trying to make your data look normal. It's trying to make the metabolite distributions look normal, and that's pretty important because that's how we can do multivariate and univariate statistics. And so that's this log, Pareto range, and auto-scaling. So this is the most useful uh, visual, and this is why it's so important to look at it. So here we've implemented auto-scaling. So before we had auto-scaling, which is on the left, you can see that this is a highly skewed, almost extreme value distribution. And so you can see in the plot, a whole bunch of things that almost seem like they're zero, and then a whole bunch of other metabolites that are ranging up to like four so here's this huge distribution. This is mirrored in this. So this is a, a box plot showing all the metabolites with their names. So almost all of us seem to have near zero concentrations. So there's these two metabolites, acetate and butyrate, um, that are huge. So they skew your distribution. Statistics, even the man Whitney U test won't work really well with that. So what you do, so we could have done a log transformation, but we just we did the we did do range scaling or auto scaling. And boom, all these things are now shifted. You make nice clean bars about the same width. You plot this all out. And that's about as nice a Gaussian curve as you can get. You have now changed your metabolite concentration data to a normal distribution, and now you can do good statistics with it. Does R scaling cause any issues when it comes to your ability to interpret the biological interpretation of the chemical analysis? No. No. Um, you'll have good p values, you'll have good sets of metabolites to work with. So, no, it, it's, uh, it won't change your interpretation. Okay, so um, it's also at this stage that you can, um, as I said, deal with some of these outliers. Um, this scaling process and looking at some of these data, um, in some cases going a few steps further, allows you to identify some of the problems in your data. Um, and so it's important to look at this or to do this early on because you don't want to have to find it later. Um, so one is to look for outliers, mistyped entries, unusual things that happen in sample preparation. Um, in the case of um, samples where you've been doing binning or just straight peak lists, sometimes you'll have to do noise reduction. 
Uh, that's another step that can be done. Looking for outliers, you can actually find outliers using uh, PCA or through uh, heat maps or cluster. This is an example where you've maybe gone all the way and you've done a PCA analysis. So the green one is separate pretty well from the red one. Cool. But here's this one, way out of here. It's not even close to the green, it's not even close to the reds. Uh, that's one where something's gone wrong. And it's either there's a scaling problem, a normalization, a typing problem, but you want to look at that. And so that's how the data analysis process actually helps you, allows you to identify things. Another one where the heat map, where you're seeing uh, it's, it's healthy and not so healthy. Um, but we're seeing this one sample, which has this dark red um, marking all the way across. Something went wrong. A sample is too dilute, or uh, all the numbers, all the decimal places were shifted by three, or something like that. So you can identify from these graphs. We can look at the specific identifier number and everything else. You can go straight back into your data and remove that outlier or fix it. Adjust the. So you can go to your Excel spreadsheet if you want to. So either way, so you can do it within Metabo Analyst, or you can do it at your in your Excel spreadsheet. Uh, there is a data reduction component, uh, data filtering or noise reduction. Uh, we're not going to go into that too much, um, but it, it is typical when you have uh, peak lists only. And you can choose which numbers or variables are going to be filtered, how many are going to be removed, uh, what percentage. Usually when you can identify noisy features, they are typically the things that are at the lowest intensities. You're not really certain about them. Um, and um, you know, those can be cleared out by, in this case, different choices. Um, um, we're not going to have to do this with this data set that we're working with, but these are some of the options that are available in Metabo Analyst. So that, we've gone through sort of these cleanup phases. It's important to do that. Once you're able to do the cleanup, then you can do the fun stuff, which is identifying the neat features, the patterns, differences between phenotypes, to do your predictions, classification, to publish your paper in Nature or Science, wherever. So um, at this stage, I've given you a half-hour introduction. What we're going to do now is spend about 15 or 20 minutes uh, going through, uh, or at least taking what I did with you just the last few minutes with the sample data set. And for you guys to then use your slides uh, to guide you through the next steps. So you're going to take the cow data set that I've just mentioned. You can use the slides and the description that I just went through so you can upload the data, take the sample data. You can choose another data set if you want, but this was designed specifically for uh, this cow uh, rumen data, and uh, you can do some ANOVA analysis, and so it's going to show you, again, it's very simple, point and click, point and click. Uh, things will be done. Uh, you should be able to get similar kinds of graphs, look at individual compounds to see how things are different, and then we're also wanting you to try and ask, answer some questions. Work together. If you're sitting beside someone, just talk to each other. This is just a good way to learn. It's not like you're being graded. If you're all alone, you can join up with a third group and shift over. Um, and if you're completely stumped, you can ask Jeff. Uh, again, these are others. So I've just highlighted on, on the left where you can click on things, what should happen after you click on them. So again, just use your, your, your printouts to help guide you. And then you can actually uh, save some of these images. We're not going to print them here, um, but you can at least save some high-resolution images. Uh, more questions, more examples. And so you're going to go all the way to just sort of following things along to which slide number is this? It's about fifth, slide 61.
<coughs> so, so it's page 39? One. 30, 31. 31. Okay. Anyway, stop at the word metabolite set enrichment analysis. And so this should take you guys about maybe 20 minutes. Uh, so we'll give you 20 minutes just to work together, take, take the samples, ask some questions, talk to each other. Uh, if it takes longer, fine. Uh, this is the play around with some of the data. Uh, you may not have finished as much as you want, but I just want to make sure that people also have an opportunity to, to look at some of the other parts of Metabo Analyst. Um, so one aspect, which is actually a fairly popular part, is called Metabolite Set Enrichment Analysis. Originally it was a standalone software web server. It's now been integrated into Metabo Analyst version 2. So you can go to either to Metabo Analyst or you can go to the MSEA website. Um, it's modeled after something that's very popular in in microarray analysis and RNA seq analysis called gene set enrichment analysis, and um, you can do a couple of different kinds of analyses. You can do looking at over representation analysis. Uh, you can do single sample profiling, and you can do quantitative enrichment analysis. Um, part of what Gene set enrichment analysis and therefore metabolite set enrichment analysis requires is you either have pathway data sets, disease sets, uh, predefined SNP associated metabolite sets to pull this stuff out. So this is how people in, at least in microarrays, associate gene patterns with a particular pathway or disease. So this is what we're trying to do with, with MSCA. Um, so it tries to group things into biologically meaningful groups. Um, and you know, if you see citrate and aconitate and uh, I'm not sure what are some of the other ones, uh, malate, all, all enriched, then you can say, okay, this, this is the TCA cycle or this is relevant for that. Um, but in other cases, if you see substantial changes in a certain class of lipids, say sphingolipids, you might find that that's associated with uh, Tay-Sachs disease, and that's another one that's listed in the biologically meaningful set. Um, right now, the MSCA is, is intended to support human metabolomic data. Uh, that's where we've collected most of the data. Although it, it shouldn't be that different for other mammals, uh, but to a, to a degree. Um, so you can work with different types of input data. You can have uh, just a whole bunch of metabolite names, so you don't have to have their concentrations. And that's the uh, overrepresentation analysis. As I said, it just if I gave you the citrate, the connotate, malate, isocitrate, it's just a bunch of names, but it allows you to say, oh, that's probably associated with the TCA cycle. Um, you can have the list of metabolite names uh, and the concentration data from a single sample. So if someone's come into a clinic, say, uh, and they say, I'm not feeling well, and then you run through a metabolomic test and you see that they have, uh, well, you measure a whole bunch of concentrations and you're seeing that their phenylalanine and, uh, and uh, phenylactate levels are compared to average uh, eight times higher. Um, so this one would compare that, that data to the average or to the norm. And this is what's been collected in the HMDB over a number of years, which is average concentrations for blood or urine or whatever else. The third one is the more typical one where you have, you know, just like what we've done with cows or, or, or in this case, it would be humans, where you have um, a whole bunch of metabolite names, a whole bunch of concentrations for multiple patients, and that's called QEA. Um, so this is just sort of the three options, the overrepresentation analysis on the left, single sample profiling in the middle, and then quantitative enrichment analysis, the classical uh, MSCA or GSEA um, uh, on, on the right. All of them will then compare against certain databases and then output some something useful. So for this example, because it's specifically for human data, we would want you guys to not use the cow data, but to use the metabolite concentrations from 77 urine samples for patients, cancer patients. 
Um, so there's about half patients uh, developed what's called cancer cachexia, and the other also had cancer but did not develop cachexia. Uh, cachexia is the muscle wasting, so if you've ever known someone who's had cancer, often in the late stages they get very, very thin and, and uh, quite weak. And this is actually um, probably the number one killer for cancer, and we have still no idea why this condition develops. Interestingly, there is a very strong metabolic signature for it, and it's seen in urine, and you can actually predict people who will develop cachexia and those who won't. Um, so I'm going to leave it here. You guys can use a few minutes where you can go through. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll maybe race through because I'll give you these two options. So you can play around with uh, the gene set enrichment or metabolite set enrichment analysis, and there's a bunch of things that you can take through, and it shows you some outputs. Uh, or if you're not particularly interested in that, uh, you can go to the next one, which is called metabolite pathway analysis. So. In this case, um, we're going beyond just simply metabolite set enrichment, but we're looking at, at, at pathways, uh, the structures of pathways. And in this case, it's not just about humans. We could look at about uh, 15 different model organisms. Um, so in this one, uh, we can upload, well, we can still use the cancer data, uh, just like we did before, the cancer cachexia. Uh, we can do classical normalization, um, but it will do or it will look at a whole bunch of pathway analyses. In this case, the paths, some of them are from plants, some of them are from prokaryotes, some of them are from uh, birds, uh, fish, and mammals. And so in this case, we'd be choosing humans, uh, but if you're looking at, at data from birds, you could potentially use um, pathway sets and pathway libraries there. Um, what this does is it does uh, network topology analysis. And this is something, again, that's become important in pathways, um, where we think about uh, hubs and nodes and bottlenecks. And we can measure things called degree centrality and betweenness <laughs> centrality, uh, just like they're very important genes or proteins that are hubs to networks. Same thing actually happens in metabolites. And this MetPA uh, allows you to identify and quantify things, uses KEG pathways as opposed to the SMIP-DB pathways, has some very cool graphics and allows you to identify which are the um, compounds that have very high impact. Uh, and they're plotted out here in terms of their importance for the pathway, whether they're hubs uh, uh, to a pathway or not. Uh, and then again, there's some questions that you could ans answer. Um, in this case, we don't have time to cover a lot of the other things. There are different clustering methods, different tools for classification. Uh, some people are interested in doing time, temporal analysis. This is something that's offered through Metaboanalyst. Um, we haven't looked at some of the data quality checks, and people have brought that up. Um, and uh, this is some examples of what you can do with a time series analysis. It used to be called MetAT, uh, but it allows you to look at things over days, hours, weeks, changing how these have changed over, over time. And then there's some data quality checking where you can look at different cohorts. This is an interesting one where uh, three different samples are being collected, one, two, three, and the purple sample is collected on the fourth day, and everything was shifted up. And this is a case where the sample evidently had been left on a, on a, a counter overnight and not frozen. So these are tools that are available that allow you to look at your data uh, and see whether there are problems and then correct that. In this case, it is statistically correctable. You wouldn't have to redo your experiment. You just simply adjust the, the mean and bring it down so you can start doing some recent, decent comparisons. So in the remaining 15, 20 minutes, um, Play around. Try it. You guys can choose one or the other, uh, or you can carry on with what you were doing before with, with the original analysis. Same time, if you're thirsty or need a bit of a break, do so now. We'll start uh, the new version, uh, last module, uh, at 3.30.